Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. Big missions call for elite forces, specifically the United States Special Forces. The units have special names, like the Green Berets or the Army Rangers. In the Navy, the SEALs. The Marines have their MARSOC units. Each group is highly trained ready to conduct various missions, including unconventional warfare, counter-terrorism, and direct action. These personnel excel in high stakes and sensitive missions. Sometimes those missions take them high in the sky require risky dives to avoid detection by the enemy. In this feature, you'll learn about those extreme techniques and the high altitude, low opening jumps, also referred to as halo jump. Before a halo jump is attempted, special forces practice regular skydiving. At Kunsan Air Base in South Korea, soldiers board an aircraft and fly to an altitude of between 3,500 to 15,000 feet. Once at the determined training altitude, they exit the aircraft and begin their descent. This is the freefall portion of the jump. During this phase, Skydivers reach speeds of up to 120 miles per hour and experience the sensation of weightlessness. A normal free fall lasts 30 seconds to a minute, but the military may push elite soldiers in training to try for longer lengths of time. Once the diver deploys his or her parachute, they can steer themselves using the canopy. As they near the ground, soldiers allow their parachutes to flare and slow down for a safe return. Falling from a helicopter is considered to be a more exhilarating and intense experience than skydiving from a fixed-wing aircraft. It can be disorienting to jump so close to the chopper's whirring rotors. In 2017, Navy sailors from the helicopter Sea Combat Squadron 5 supported U.S. Army Rangers during a helocast mission in Florida. When jumping out of a helicopter, it doesn't matter how highly trained you are. 
No one is immune to the noise and wind created by the rotating blades. That rotation creates a powerful draft, called a rotor wash, which can make it difficult for a soldier to orient himself in the air. Jumpers are usually instructed to fall away from the helicopter and clear the rotor wash as quickly as possible. At that point, the freefall experience is similar to skydiving from a plane. Jumpers will reach high speeds and experience the sensation of weightlessness. They'll have to navigate to a landing area while avoiding obstacles. A halo jump is considered to be one of the most challenging types of parachute jumps. It requires jumpers to leap from a high altitude, where the air is thin and the temperature is low, and to open their parachute at a low altitude to avoid detection by enemy forces. When jumping from a high altitude, jumpers typically wear special equipment, such as oxygen tanks and masks, to help them survive the jump. Jumpers also don special suits to protect them from cold temperatures at high altitudes. During the jump, Special Forces personnel will experience a longer freefall period than a standard parachute jump, as they are coming down from a higher altitude. They are expected not to open their parachutes until they're low to the ground, to avoid radar detection by an adversary. That low opening altitude makes the canopy ride shorter and more intense, and the jumper must be prepared to land quickly. During a readiness exercise, paratroopers belonging to the 82nd Airborne Division jumped out of a C-17 Globemaster over North Carolina. These soldiers practice at night to be comfortable deploying a parachute and landing in darkness. This exercise is expected to help prepare these soldiers to respond anywhere in the world with only a few hours notice. Special forces must also be able to land in extreme conditions, including sub-zero temperatures. In the depth of winter in 2021, the Spartan Brigade kicked off Exercise Arctic Warrior at Donnelly Training Area in Alaska. Jumpers in this sort of climate wear much more gear, usually insulated jumpsuits, gloves, and boots.
They are also commonly seen wearing masks to protect their faces and eyes from the cold winds. An Arctic jump itself is similar to a standard parachute jump. Still, the soldiers must navigate to a landing zone while avoiding obstacles such as trees and rocks, which can be difficult to see in the snowy terrain. Jumpers will also need to be prepared for the possibility of landing in deep snow, which can make it difficult to extract themselves and their equipment. Once on the ground, special forces must be prepared to operate in a cold and inhospitable environment. They must set up camp, build fires, and take other measures to stay warm and survive. In 1960, Colonel Joseph Kittinger set a world record for the highest parachute jump by jumping from an altitude of 102,800 feet as part of a U.S. Air Force research program. The jump was made from a helium balloon carrying him to the edge of space. It took Kittinger 13 minutes to reach the ground. During the freefall portion of the jump, he reached a top speed of 614 miles per hour. He experienced temperatures as low as negative 94 degrees Fahrenheit. Kittinger's jump was a significant achievement and helped pave the way for future high altitude and space research. His record stood for 52 years until 2012 when a skydiver named Felix Baumgartner broke it by jumping from a height of 128,097 feet, roughly three miles higher than Kittinger's jump. During his time in the Air Force, Kittinger also helped test the ejection seat. trying to simulate the head accelerations, the neck loads, the spinal loads um, that occur during that high-speed ejection and determining if the ejection seats that we're interested in will be within safe limits that the Air Force has established over the years. These static tests take place on the ground. Test dummies or mannequins are used to evaluate the performance of the ejection seat and the safety of the design. The Air Force also conducts dynamic ejection seat tests, which imitate a real-life emergency scenario. The test pilots, or volunteer pilots, are then ejected from the aircraft to see how the ejection seat performs. The data collected from both of these tests go toward developing future safety standards for tomorrow's aircraft. From learning how to jump from a plane or a helicopter to understanding how to navigate a parachute into an Arctic environment and studying the effects of an ejection seat, the military is prepared for anything that could happen to its men and women in the air.
that's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.